Coming up on One Detroit, telemedicine and how it's changing the relationship with our doctors, plus what we can all do to fight racism and understand systemic injustice. Also coming up, world-renowned author on grief, David Kessler, on what we're all experiencing in a COVID-19 world. Then analysis of the auto industry with John McElroy. And finally, keeping a small business running during the pandemic. We'll head to Ronnie Berry's Halal Meats in Dearborn. I'm Christy McDonald. Join me. One Detroit is coming up. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Hope you're enjoying these beautiful summer days as we're all trying to adjust to more of life opening up but still dealing with the risk of COVID-19. Coming up on One Detroit, as demonstrations and marches continue against systemic racism across the country, how to understand what we're all seeing and feeling, what we can do, what we can say, and how to listen. We'll talk with Charity Dean, the Director of Civil Rights, Inclusion and Opportunity for the City of Detroit. Plus, auto workers are back on the line, suppliers in full swing. One of the best auto journalists in the biz, John McElroy, talks about the long-term challenges to the automotive industry. And then life may be opening up, but we have been experiencing grief over the lives we once had. How do we move through it? Some help from renowned grief author David Kessler. And then keeping a family business going during the pandemic, we'll head to Dearborn. But first, we're taking a closer look at the major change COVID-19 is making to medicine and how doctors are now treating patients. Bill Kubota has the story. Did I ever think that I'd be doing Zoom patient visits? I thought nothing short of a pandemic would cause that, but here we are. Three weeks ago, you could not reach a patient on the phone and communicate and have a legitimate ethical visit you can now. Love him or hate him, Trump said this is equal to a face-to-face -face visit. This. Because we needed people to see people. So what happened is the government sat back and said, we've got patients that need to have immediate access to their physicians. So we're going to relax those requirements and we're going to allow for conversations to be happening over the public channels. Ones that you and I and our children and others have been using for a long time, known as either Google Duo or FaceTime or some of the other products that are currently available online for us to communicate with families overseas, for example. Of course, telehealth really was a thing before COVID-19, seen in rural areas like Mississippi in this public TV report before the pandemic, when HIPAA rules required more extensive, expensive communications technology. Dr. William Maroney has been pushing for more telehealth while practicing addiction medicine across Michigan's thumb. Now we're looking at it happening everywhere. And it just three, four weeks ago, right? Right. And it should be happening everywhere because Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, it's 2020. We've been hearing about telemedicine for 40 years. That we had to literally shift our entire way of doing business unexpectedly and within about four days. In Detroit, the Children's Center's mental health services pretty much all now delivered by telehealth. So we had initially thought that we would decrease the number of people coming to our campus. Um, and then we had a, a meeting with our executive leadership team and it was decided, you know, we think it's in everyone's best interest to just figure out how to do our job remotely. Okay, so 
you hurt your elbow. Michigan State University Healthcare quickly turned to telehealth. In East Lansing, they're finding new ways not to see patients in person. We went from in sports medicine, we didn't have telehealth at all. It wasn't on our radar at all. And then like within seven days, it was live. And so we've had to adjust the way we interact with patients, adjust the way that we perform visits. Uh, it, it seems silly, but for, for me, looking at joints and how people interact and move is still very important. And so we have people at home that I'll have them, a spouse hold the, the computer while they walk around or while they move their knee or move their shoulder. So we can still deliver the best quality care that we've always delivered, but just in a fashion that enables the patient to remain safe. Detroit area psychiatrist yes, Terry Vigor sees an opportunity for, for seniors. Patients, it doesn't seem to be a big deal as long as they have a cell phone. The rate limiting factor is, do they have a cell phone? And then number two, if they do have a cell phone, do they have unlimited or enough data to be able to use the platform? Dr. Vigor has started using the Doximity app with her patients. Or search for a phone list near you. She calls it Facebook for physicians. Seniors with just landlines can't use it, so she started a nonprofit hoping to raise money to buy them smartphones. It's all about ease of use. And then at the bottom, if you can see, all I do is tap video call or phone call. The patient gets a phone call, like an ordinary phone call, and then they'll see something to touch, you know, that says I give permission and that's it. That's all there is to it. Then there's another component of telehealth that's easier, getting the money. Limited reimbursement results in limited access. Um, and so that was the, I believe the biggest changes. The technology was always there. And so now the fact that it's paid and paid by their insurance, um, it, it, it makes it more viable. And what's happened is suddenly physicians are getting paid for the time that they are providing. If you and I are having a 15, 20 minute conversation, in the past, a physician would not be compensated for having that type of encounter. And yet they should be because there is medical decision making that is occurring. Up until three weeks ago, there was no payment for that. Now there is. And are you worried that this may not continue after this uh, COVID-19 crisis subsides? I think that they will see the advance of technology saved lives and money. Studies of telehealth's effectiveness, they studies, they'll come in time. So but Detroit area healthcare care provider, Eva Matyshevsky, has a plea for Lansing regulators now. The request of the governor of the state of Michigan, please don't go ahead and pull things back. The healthcare community has to realize we are going to be experiencing severe PTSD. We will not have enough behavior health folks to be able to meet the needs of those individuals that will be struggling uh, with mental health issues. So it's extremely important for us to not only maintain, but perhaps enhance what it is that we currently are doing in the, in the way of telehealth. As we've all watched this past week, demonstrations against police brutality around the country and here in Michigan, from Detroit to Lansing to Grand Rapids. Many of us have joined in support, our friends in the black community, but sometimes it is hard to know exactly the right thing to say or the best way to support this movement. Charity Dean is the Director of Civil Rights, Inclusion and Opportunity for the City of Detroit. She put a powerful message on Facebook addressing just that. Will Glover spoke with her. So many people have said, how can I help during this time? This did not happen overnight and it's not going to go away overnight. We are committed in our department to this fight for the long haul. And so today I have a message about what you can do to act today. Three ways that you can act. A, C, T. You can acknowledge, you can confront, and you can talk. Acknowledge pain, confront bias, and talk. So just, I guess, expand on that a little bit for me. How did you uh, come to that? And you know, what made you uh, decide to post a message in the first place? Um, obviously our country is hurting, but I was hurting. You know, as a black woman uh, in a black city, um, 
leading a civil rights department, I was torn, you know. Um, I understood the frustration and the anger that I saw, um, but also was like hev heavily burdened with how do we respond. And it's really odd, you know, uh, as black people, we uh, are burdened with the pain, but also are burdened with uh, the, the, the drive to fix the problem that is burdening us. It's a, it's a unique situation that we're in, but um, there are so many people and mostly actually people that had reached out that were not people of color. And they said, what can we do? You know, and so acknowledging the pain is really the first step. You can't really have a conversation with someone if they don't realize that racism is real. And then confronting bias is another huge one. We all have bias. I have biases, right? They're based on how we were raised. But then you have to look internally and say, what about me? Confront your own bias and then being open to have a conversation about it. So talking to people. Um, I think that's one of the ways that we can uh, affect change. How, how are you feeling? What's, what's been on your mind? The terrific, huge, monumental burden uh, that rests upon Black people to tear down a structure that we didn't build, that wasn't built for us, that was built on our backs. I think that's been on my mind. And it doesn't mean we're not going to fight, right? It doesn't mean that I'm tired and I'm not going to continue to push against the structure. But uh, everything that I've said to, to white allies that have reached out is you've got to get angry and you've got to get frustrated and you've got to use your privilege to knock this shit down. Otherwise, it won't happen. And so that is on my mind. And I am praying uh, for the family of George Floyd. Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey. I'm still praying for Trayvon Martin's family. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still praying for Tamir. Like, it, I'm still praying because the pain doesn't go away. And when you don't see justice and when you see the same thing happening over and over again, I'm sure it just makes that pain even worse. I'm praying for my people. Uh, but I'm praying that this time something happens. Joining me now is well-known author and lecturer on grief and death, David Kessler. He co-authored with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on grief and grieving. He's helped thousands of people face death, dying, grief, working in hospital systems on the Red Cross disaster team. His latest book is Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief. David, thanks for joining me. It's good to see you. Good to be with everyone. I, you know, at this time where I think we're all trying to label I, I think what we're feeling, whether it's anxiety, whether it's sadness, um, is it grief that we're feeling? It is. So many people have shared that they're just sad at night or they woke up with this heavy feeling. And I think it's important we name it as grief. You know, we, we think of grief as when someone dies, and that certainly is the worst grief we have. And yet at the same time, canceling a wedding your kids not being able to have their play dates. And this sort of the world we knew a month ago is gone forever. And we're grieving a lot. As a society though, are we comfortable with the word grief? It doesn't seem like we are though sometimes. Not at all. And it's important we label it because if we don't, we're just pushing these feelings down. I'm not gonna feel sad because no one died in my life. I'm not gonna be angry because I have enough food. And we end up being this culture of half-felt emotions. That almost seems like shame, like grief shame. Like I, my feelings aren't valuable enough to, to, to feel them. Correct. We go, oh, you know, we, we try to tell our kids, you know, this is a virus. Don't be sad that you have to do this. And not understanding, they're sad. They're sad. You know, people always ask me, which is the worst grief? Is it a death? Is it a divorce? You know, what's this collective grief we're feeling? I say the worst grief is always your grief. Do we get a little impatient? Do we want to say, David, tell me my grief will be better in two weeks and the benchmark of one month. Um, there's no limit on grieving, um, but I think sometimes we search for it. If I always say the goal is to grieve with more love than pain. And we're going to miss this world we knew. You know, the world's going to be different in the future. And so 
we're going to have moments of nostalgia and sadness. That's going to be part of our life from now on. How do you think this pandemic will change the way we think about grief, will change the way we validate the feelings that we have, and even talking about mental health moving forward, because I feel that we've been forever changed by this. And maybe as a society, we're not totally equipped to say, all right, well, let's talk about this. It's just like, okay, we're fine. Let's just keep moving forward. And that's so important because every tragedy like this, epidemic, pandemic, war, whatever it may be, we come out of it with some people having post-traumatic stress. Some people come out of it fine. My goal is to help us come out with as much post-traumatic growth as possible. What and, while, and while it's important we name the feelings of grief, we also need to name the feelings as we find meaning. Because meaning is what helps us get closer to that post-traumatic growth there's meaningful moments occurring. I studied Viktor Frankl's work. I was so curious about how do you appreciate a sunset in a concentration camp? How do you find the light in the darkness? And even now, I live on a block with 30 homes. I didn't know any of my neighbors. We're now on a text chain. Someone's going to the grocery store. The guy at the end, the elderly man, what can we get him? Parents are in front of their house playing with their kids like they're having a play date with their own kids. Those are meaningful moments. You and I are having a meaningful moment now. If we name these meaningful moments, that will help us grow through this and not just go through this. I caught up with uh, AutoLine host and auto journalist John McElroy for a look at what's heading on with the auto industry as they have gone back to work this week. Go ahead and take a look. You've seen uh, strikes, you've seen mergers, you've seen bankruptcies. How would you compare all of those to a global disruption and a pandemic like this and, and what we're seeing happen to, to the auto industry? Boy, mix all that together and throw in a recession, throw in a depression, and you got what we're into right now. We have never seen anything like this in the automotive industry. I mean, even if you go back to the Great Depression in the 1930s, that took several years to roll out. We have seen the entire global economy just come to a screeching halt in a matter of weeks. The plants are gonna be opening back up again, the, the slow roll and the start. What is this really going to look like and, and, and how can the companies get back up to a level of production that they were at when everything stopped? Getting back to a level like before is going to be dictated by whether or not people are buying cars and trucks in the numbers that they did before. That's not going to happen. We know for a fact there's going to be a huge drop off in sales. If only because if you look at the daily rental companies with so little travel going around the country right now, China has been back at work for nearly two months now. Europe is a few weeks ahead of us, and all we have to do is look at what's going on there to know what's going to happen here. And it's everything you already know about. Wear a mask, get thermally scanned before you go into a plant, maintain social distancing, put up barriers between different workstations, wipe down work areas three times a shift, stagger the shifts and have the shifts come in through different doors so people don't walk by each other. That's what it's going to take talking about possibly another bailout for the auto industry. There's already talk going on in Washington right now. Are we going to see that kind of help again, or what are you hearing? I think it's inevitable. The rule of thumb is for every job in the auto industry, it supports about seven other jobs in the rest of the economy. So if you want to get the American economy rolling again, you got to get the auto industry rolling and vice versa. I think there could be uh, a number of people in the public who are going to say, ah, look, we bailed those guys out a decade ago. The heck with them. But I, I think cooler heads will prevail. Uh, you lose the auto industry. Man, there's no way that this uh, economy is going to recover. In Michigan, we've talked so much in the last 20 years about diversifying our economy, not relying so much on automotive. But yet, do you believe that in numbers-wise, are, aren't we still really tied to the success? of auto. Yeah, we really are. I mean, it, it, it's great to talk about diversif diversifying the economy and it, it, and it is necessary. But when you have a General Motors, a Ford, a, an FCA, and by the way, too, Toyota with a massive engineering co uh, complex, with Nissan here, with Hyundai Kia here, it, it's just hard to make them a smaller part of the Michigan economy because they're just such big companies.
all I've been doing is sitting home and uh, wore out the couch, had to go buy a new couch. When the pandemic hit, Ronnie Berry took a break, but not for long. So we did, we closed our doors right away. Now it's been two months that we've been curbside pickup only. Nobody comes in the shop. I have a very close friend of mine that, that is in the hospital right now and I pray for him every day. And, and I have uh, my son's father-in-law that's in the hospital and he's getting better. You know, uh, they've been there for over five weeks on a ventilator. So honestly, that's when it hit down to earth. That's when it hits home. You know, when you have close people you know that are in there. And we already lost two of my customers that have passed away from the cor coronavirus. Stuck inside, people still have to eat. Ronnie Berry's Halal Meats has been busy, although the profit margin is down with beef prices going way up. I don't know if it's going to stay the same or what's going to happen down the road. Nobody knows. That's the thing. You know, the, the, the governor has put the clamps on us for a while, but thank God we got a business that we can keep open. You know, I feel sorry for the restaurant people, people like that, that, that can't open their shops. Not too long ago, one Detroit's Nolan Finley took a tour of Dearborn's South End neighborhood with Hassan Khalifa of the Arab American News. You know, ethnic families like shopping at stores and, and markets that cater to their own needs and, and cultural tastes. So they don't like usually to go shop at Meyer, for example, or, or Walmart. Their first stop, the butcher's shop at Dixon Verner. And from the walls, it looks like you might be serving some wild game. Or yeah, I, I, I hunt. I, I hunt. It's a hobby, something you like to do. Get a little getaway, you know. So how long have you had this shop? This, this shop has been here since 1947. You grew up in this shop? Yeah, I grew up in this shop. Went to Salina School, Henry Ford College, uh, Fortson High School, the whole routine, you know. Oh, yeah, this was the original, uh, I guess you could say, where all the Muslims came in the beginning before Dearborn really got started. Well, originally this area was big time Lebanese. Back in the early 50s, the first Islamic center in Detroit was, a, there was the Hashmi Hall Society, which was on the corner right there. That was the first, first Islamic center. Then the Baca Valley Islamic center. But this is the area that everybody started here because of Ford Motor. They were able to walk from here to work. My grandfather worked for $5 a day. My grandfather came here in 1928. Construction of the Ford Rouge complex had just been completed when Barry's grandfather arrived. Arab immigrants settled in the South End. The Union Hall's across the street, the Salina School still behind it. Some things have stayed, other things have changed. You know, uh, since the, my, my boys, the technology guys, put us on Google and Yelp and stuff, <laughs> where we're getting a lot of people that we never seen before. Mm -hmm. And we asked them and they told us, well, I found you on Google and we got a five-star review, you know? Okay. And, and everything we do is like an old-fashioned shop. That's the way it's always been here. We get everybody to come here. They're, they're not, not necessarily just Muslims. We have Christians, we have, we have all different types of cultures that come here. Anybody that eats lamb, basically, know us, you know? And, and their stories like my story, like my dad's story, they all came here at a certain time and brought their families over. You know, my dad came here first, brought his brothers, brought his family, brought his sisters, like everybody in this country. Who's the true American? True American is the Indian. That's the true American. So how, how the demographics changed? You know, are there more Yemeni Americans? Uh, in this area, yeah. yeah. We got a lot of uh, Pakistani in this area, mostly Yemeni American because of the mosque. They like to stay in walking distance of the mosque. And if, if you go down where I, I used to play ball in Canterbury Park, they just built five homes at the old park. They're building here to stay here. You know, if you went to West Dearborn or, or East Dearborn back in the 60s, it was a ghost town. There was nobody there, you know. And then they, everybody went there and they went to Dearborn Heights. Now they're going out to Garden City, Canton, you know. More halal food throughout the metro area. Back where it started, Ronnie Berry's renovating, getting ready for customers to come back inside, adding plexiglass barriers and other things to keep everybody safe. Because I'm, I'm happy for what I have, to be honest with you. I don't want to get too big where you can't control anything. Here, I got a nice little shop. I control it. You know, my sons will take it over. Give me my health and you can have the money. That's the way it is, honestly. Give me my health 
and you can have all the money. And that'll do it for One Detroit. Thanks so much for joining me. For our daily interviews and coverage, just go to OneDetroitPBS.org. And remember to catch a new episode of One Detroit Monday nights at 7.30. It's devoted to the arts and culture scene that's adjusting to the changes due to these unprecedented times. Enjoy your weekend. I will see you Monday and next Thursday for another One Detroit. Take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you.